So welcome to the third part of the lecture. In this part, we will talk about design patterns and design patterns with a particular focus on software variability. So the idea of this part of the lecture is to show you how design patterns can actually help us to realize software variability at source code. We will look especially at object-oriented design patterns and this part of the lecture is not only connected to runtime variability, but also to any other technique that we are aiming at for variability at all. But we will first uh, focus on uh, the previous examples that we've uh, looked at for runtime variability, but we'll also come back later in other lectures uh, in terms of design patterns. So before diving into uh, details with uh, design patterns, uh, you, we assume that all uh, people uh, hearing this course and people listening this video are uh, already familiar with object orientation with, uh, with respect to a certain extent. You probably also have uh, programming experience with object orientation. See, the idea is object orientation is a technique and object oriented programming is a technique to help us split larger programs into smaller parts to be able to develop them more easily. And there are a couple of key concepts that are used. One is that of abstraction and information hiding, so encapsulation. The idea is that we have certain abstractions of our domain, so the domain that the software is developed for, and an abstraction is, for instance, an object, but also a package or some other structure. And for each object or class or package, we can have some information hiding, which basically means this is the basic principle that we will ever need uh, when we develop large or huge software systems uh, is information hiding, where we hide some of the implementation details, some of the data, some of the uh, implementation details from other parts of the software. So for instance, we could imagine that we can have a picture and this picture uh, can have certain shapes in there. We also uh, talk about composition, about nesting objects. So in this, uh, in this picture, we see that uh, shape is actually, um, uh, or a picture is composed of several different shapes that we can have inside of the picture. We do have some message, message passing, I'm sorry, uh, to delegate the responsibility. So for instance, we have a picture and we want to uh, get an area of the picture, uh, for instance, to draw the picture. And then we forward this to the square. And then we forward this to a rectangle, whatever is part of this uh, picture overall. So this is message passing. So we delegate some responsibility. So overall, we want to draw this picture. And we delegate uh, the drawing of the square to the square object and a drawing of the rectangle to the rectangle object. Then we have a distribution of the responsibility overall. So we have different uh, separation of concerns. Uh, so we have squares, we have rectangles, and they can be drawn rather independent from each other. And then we have inheritance as a conceptual hierarchy, we have polymorphism, we have reuse. So overall, the idea is that we have different kinds of shapes. And we also uh, mentioned this over here, that we have certain shapes. Uh, and the shape can be either a square or a rectangle or a circle or some other parts. And there are some commonalities of the implementation that we can put into the class shape, but there are also some differences that are reflected in the subclasses in the inheritance relationship in squares, rectangles, and circles. We could even uh, further um, extend this by having squares below rectangles or rectangles below squares uh, and things like that. So this is a very brief recap of object orientation, and you might have seen these class diagrams or sequence diagrams before. So again, another recap, because we assume that most uh, listeners of this course are already uh, familiar with design patterns, I will keep this rather short. So the idea is that we have um, 
common problems uh, occurring frequently uh, during design and frequently means frequently overall and not that I'm experiencing uh, this very same problem every day during programming. But the idea of design patterns is to find a common solution to uh, to uh, yeah this common problem during uh, implementation, and it's it suggests a, a certain um, yeah concrete implementation for a specific uh, problem, and object-oriented design patterns are devoted to object-oriented programming here. So there's this large catalog uh, that you, probably most of you have heard of this book already by the Gang of Four, by um, these four authors. And um, this, this uh, book uh, gives you a very extensive catalog of design patterns that are applied in practice. There are more than I've written in this book, but there are also more written in this book than you will frequently need in practice. So we will look at three uh, design patterns here in more detail. We will look at them and we do not want to get into too many details uh, about the particular design pattern itself, but how it can be applied to variability. So I will do a brief recap for all of them. If you are not so familiar with, uh, with design patterns yet, uh, I will link another video over here where you can have a look at um, design patterns. So let's dive into uh, the topic. Uh, what we first have a look at uh, will be the template method pattern. Let me just check here. Yeah. So the template method pattern uh, has the intention that we want to define the overall structure of an algorithm while we allow some subclasses to refine, uh, redefine, or uh, uh, yeah, change certain aspects um, uh, of the algorithm. The motivation is we want to avoid code replication. We talked about code replication as one of the problems uh, that we can face with runtime variability, but also with other uh, variability techniques, as we will see later on. And the idea is we, we want to avoid them because whenever we have code replication, changing one position might fix or break also other other parts of the source code. We want to avoid this, so we want to implement the general workflow of the algorithm once and allow necessary variations by means of subclassing. So the idea is a template method defines the skeleton of an algorithm. Concrete methods uh, override these hook methods. So what we have is we have uh, an abstract class, uh, uh, at least in most cases when we apply this in practice, this will probably be an abstract class, can also be a concrete one. And we have a certain uh, template method. So of course, in a particular example case, when you apply this, you will have a particular name, uh, for instance, you want to do sorting. And then for sorting, it might be relevant that sometimes you want to sort upwards and sometimes downwards, uh, S-scanning or D-scanning. And what we can do is provide this additional information, whether we want to sort uh, descanning or scanning uh, by means of this hook method. And we see that this hook method is uh, here actually, uh, yeah, uh, italic. And that it is italic means that this is just a hook. It's uh, a possible way how to, uh, how to change this algorithm. So it's just an abstract method over here, and it can be replaced by concrete implementations in subclasses. And we have an inheritance relationship over here, and then we can have different classes, and they can make the possible changes. Of course, what is always needed for this approach to work is that we understand what are the um, what are the positions where I want to uh, yeah, provide hooks uh, later on. So I need to predefine all the hooks in order to be able to make those extensions afterwards. So the template method needs to envision already when I apply this, what, what are the po possible positions where I want to apply a certain hook. So I want to show you another uh, 
example, another for a design pattern, and this is the abstract factory pattern. So again, this is a recap for all those people that uh, know the abstract factory already might skip this part in the video. The intention is we want to provide an interface cr for creating families of related or dependent uh, objects with, uh, without specifying their concrete classes. So the idea is that we have many situations in the program where a certain object is instantiated or where a family of objects, so it could be edges and nodes in our graph example. And these are instantiated. Yeah? We have a new edge, new uh, node at many different places all over the program. And when we want to replace this later on, because we say we don't want to look at only uh, edges, directed edges, but also undirected edges, we need to find all those places and replace all those uh, by means of case distinctions. So first, it's we need to identify all those, uh, all those places. We need these case distinctions. And these can be very long. And these are not very open to future extensions, because every future extension need to apply to every possible case distinction. And we have duplicates even of those case distinctions. So that's why we want to avoid this. And the idea is to create classes that consistently create new objects. So how does this work? As we said, we want to create products. So uh, for instance, we could have a product for edges. And we do not want to create these new edges uh, right away, but rather we want to uh, create them by means of a method. So this method, for instance, could be over here saying that uh, I want to create uh, edges of a particular type over here. Now, in, and we might also have other uh, uh, objects that we want to create. So for instance, we could have a node. And uh, we have particular kinds of nodes. Uh, for instance, we might have uh, the uncolored version of a node and a colored version of the node. So, and again, we need a certain uh, method uh, because edges and nodes are obviously different from each other. So we need two methods to create those. So why do we want to have an abstraction of edges of product A over here? Why do we want to have this? Yeah, we want to have this in some way because we want to be able to exchange edges so, uh, for instance, directed edges, uh, weighted edges. We want to have these different kind of edges. And we need to find a type for the variables. Whenever we have an edge in the program, we need to have a common subtype for those. And this is then an abstract edge or just named edge in the case. And now, why do we have this abstract factory? The idea is that we can also exchange the initialization with another initialization. Because uh, let's take another color for here. But I think I already screwed the, the visualization. Let's take another color and say that this method should create this kind of product. And this method should create this kind of product. So in order to replace, easily replace, the concrete factory in one position by another factory, uh, we also need this abstraction of an abstract factory. And that's where the name comes from. And the how it is applied in practice might also be that the factories are nature, not actually abstract, but it's a factory. And we can have subclasses. We can imagine the same for edges. We have a base implementation of edges and then uh, subclasses for weighted edges or uh, directed edges. So while this is the, the overall uh, idea, um, there's another pattern that we want to uh, explain and introduce over here. Again, this is a recap. If you already know the decorator pattern, you may skip this part. Uh, the idea is we might have the the uh, the finding that there are certain objects that kind of do a lot of things right and we want to 
uh, bring uh, the object to a core that it actually does what it does as a core functionality. And then we want to have decorators uh, that can be combined dynamically uh, to decorate this object with additional functionality. So once we have the decorator, we have the additional functionality. And if we leave out the decorator, we have the basic implementation. That, that's where we already see some kind of variability. here. The motivation is we want to avoid the explosion of static classes when combining all the additional behaviors with all applicable classes. So with subclassing, we will see this later in more detail. And the idea is we create decorators for all the uh, possible additional behaviors that we want to support and we create components with the basic uh, information. And these support the same kind of info interface as we see over here. So we have concrete components. And in, this, in our case, this could be, for instance, an edge. And then we have concrete decorators. And these decorators could say, OK, we want to have directed edges. But we could also have other decorators that say the edge is weighted. And the reason why we have a common uh, interface that is called component over here, the reason for this is we want to combine them uh, all together in different combinations. We want to specify uh, either an edge or a directed edge, uh, often weighted edge of an edge. And that's why we have also this particular uh, notion of an abstract decorator, which is the superclass uh, of all the possible different decorators that we can imagine. And we will see this right away in an example. So imagine an object or in the design of a graph library. We looked at the graph library in the second part of the talk from an implementation perspective already. And over there, we had edges and nodes. And they had directly uh, all the functionality in there. What about modularization, about better, better modularization? What about subclassing? Uh, what about introducing subclasses for weighted edges for colored nodes in this example? The problem with this is that we uh, will have the same for graphs, right? So the graphs, uh, there will be different kinds of graphs. Uh, we need subclasses for weighted graphs and colored graphs. So let's look how those three design patterns can help us with the implementation. For instance, we could use the idea of hook methods uh, as we have them in the template method pattern. And we already see uh, that the idea of applying design patterns is not to have a direct translation into the source code, but rather we want to take the ideas out of the uh, design patterns. And in this case, for instance, our graph is not an abstract class, but a graph is rather uh, over the concrete class in this example. But we do have a hook method. So this is a hook method. And uh, in the example before, we've had this as an abstract class. But here we could also say, OK, this is a class with creating a, yeah. a normal edge. And then we have a weighted graph, which is an extension of the graph that overrides this hook method uh, by also taking care of the initialization of the weights. And what we see here is, uh, yeah, again, the visualization of what's going on here. We have these edges and weighted edges, and we create now, uh, can create now different kinds of edges. So what I haven't mentioned so far is that over here you see we are creating edges, and over here we are creating weighted edges. So you see how the, the template method pattern can be applied in this use case. We can also use the graph, uh, the abstract factory pattern. And over here, we can say, OK, we have um, an edge factory. And this edge factory, of course, needs to be provided whenever I call the constructor and I need to save this. And the edge factory uh, knows how to create edges. And then I might have another uh, edge factory, which extends 
the edge factory. Uh, it's called weighted edge factory. And this factory has the slightly different behavior of creating weighted edges instead of weights. And again, we see some slight variations uh, with respect to the abstract factory pattern. So the uh, class edge factory is actually not an abstract class, but a concrete class already. But it depends, always depends on the use case, uh, what we actually need, whether this should be an abstract uh, class or a concrete class is sufficient. So we see that the variability was kind of introduced. We can support our graph with an edge factory. And this can be either an edge factory or a weighted edge factory. So what about feature combinations? We already looked at the graph. So we have kind of weighted graph and a colored graph. But what about a weighted colored graph? And this is a, a general problem when it comes to features, options that are kind of uh, can be combined arbitrarily with each other, because then we need to think of all the combinations. And over here, we would need to create uh, different uh, combinations of the classes. This is known as a diamond problem, and it's related to multiple inheritance. So most object-owned program, uh, programming languages do not support multiple inheritance or only some workarounds. So for instance, in Java, we will have interfaces. And since, I don't know, a certain a Java version a couple of years ago, there were default methods introduced uh, in interfaces. And now we can have kind of multiple inheritance in Java, but only in terms of interfaces and not in terms of subclassing. The critical part in this is how to handle name clashes. And we can see this over here. So we have a graph. It has an add edge method. We have a weighted graph with an add edge uh, method and a colored graph with the same method. And the question is, which add edge method should I call if I have weighted colored graphs? And how most uh, programming language actually solve this problem is whenever you have such an instance of the diamond problem, then you have to specify an add met method and need to specify what happens over here. So even if multiple inheritance is supported, what we would still need to do is to uh, create all the possible combinations of our features, of our options, in terms of a static um, inheritance hierarchy. This means we don't only have uh, weighted graphs and colored graphs in our example, but we also have, have, have had directed graphs. And then we have all the possible combinations of those. And you can even imagine that we can have weighted colored directed graphs and so on. Right? So there might be many more combinations. And these were just a brief, some brief examples for different kinds of graphs that we can have. And we don't want to create all those static combinations in classes, but we also want, don't want to, uh, yeah, uh, not in all the cases we want this runtime overhead that is involved with dealing with all those classes at runtime. So. The decorator pattern is a possible solution for this problem. And how is it a solution? Um, you might want to have a look again uh, on the previous slide explaining the uh, uh, decorator pattern in detail. But what we do is we say uh, we have now a basic uh, graph implementation interface. Uh, then we have a graph decorator. And this can decorate any particular iGraph. And then we have a weighted graph. And this weighted graph can actually uh, decorate any eye graph, which can be a colored graph, which can be a graph, which can be, again, another weighted graph. And then we say, what's actually different? And what's different is how to add a new no, uh, edge to this graph. And over there, we add, use, actually make use of the original implementation, and then uh, additionally, assign the weight. 
And what happens here is uh, what we can see down here is an example usage of this. Uh, so maybe it would have been better to introduce this earlier. So we have the iGraph over here. Um, then we can have the standard implementation of graphs. Then we have colored graphs and weighted graphs, which are basically different kinds of graph decorators. And this is the most crucial part of this diagram because it says that every graph decorator has exactly one iGraph. Yeah? And this is what we, what we can see over here. So how to use this? Um, we can use this at runtime to decide which combination of graphs we need. So this is again a possibility of using even different uh, kinds of graphs simultaneously uh, or even um, yeah, applying uh, the using a graph in, in terms of different kinds. So we can create a new weighted graph by passing it a new colored graph, by passing it a new graph. And then we might have uh, a weighted edge factory saying that whenever we create uh, a new weighted graph, we also want to use that pattern to create weighted edges. So another option uh, to do this uh, instead of this uh, or uh, a discussion of uh, using the decorator pattern, what we do is we use delegation instead of inheritance. Right? So inheritance was the option to statically build all the possible combinations of, of graphs. But what we did here is the principle of delegation. So extensions features can be combined dynamically, but this means they must be independent of each other. So all needs to have the same uh, the same methods, and uh, we need to we need an implementation where it's independent whether I have colored or uncolored nodes uh, when I implement the weighted edges. So this is not the case in practice for every use case. Uh, we can not really add public methods. Of course, we could add a public method to a decorator, but once we put another decorator. Uh, around this, we cannot access this method anymore so easily. Uh, there's runtime overhead due to these indirections because we have an indirection for every um, decorator. And we have several physical objects actually forming a conceptual one. And this is a problem at runtime because we might have several lookups in the memory when we look for the different objects. But we, it also, when it comes to object identi uh, identity, when we look up whether we actually uh, working with the same objects. So again, the decorator pattern is one option, but it's uh, still not uh, applicable in all the possible cases. And the idea of presenting you these three design patterns uh, for variability, abstract factory, uh, the decorator pattern, uh, these, uh, the, the idea was that you understand how design patterns can support variability, but there's not a single design pattern that we can be applied in all the possible cases. We can express variability with object orientation. Uh, we can express variability to some extent with design patterns. Uh, we can uh, provide new extensions to the existing code by means of delegation or by means of inheritance. We used inheritance, for instance, for the template method pattern and delegation for with the decorator pattern. We have certain limitations and drawback with respect to feature combinations. Uh, and we will see in later lectures that we have uh, strategies to implement product lines that are way more um, um, flexible in designing exactly those uh, combinations that we need. Uh, with less runtime overhead, for instance, uh, but we will come there. But this basically doesn't mean that we should avoid design patterns at all. But in most cases, this means that uh, design patterns are not a solution for every possible uh, design problem that we have when it comes to software variability. So there's again for the reading uh, in a book on object-oriented uh, programming by Bertrand Maillet and uh, the Ging of Four book, uh, which basically gives you an overview over for the design patterns. And now you could think of what characterizes modular software design and why can it support variability? So how does modularity in terms of 
classes, subclasses, inheritance, how does it support variability, and in which sense are ob object-oriented solutions more modular than simple uh, conditional statements. So in, in which way does it enhance the runtime variability if we are actually using this object-oriented design patterns? And then it's a question, do you know any other design patterns that are supporting variability? For instance, you could have a look at the Gang of Four book and see what other design patterns are out there and which are supporting variability of those. We also have a couple of questions for you. Uh, do not get overwhelmed by the slide, but this might prove helpful uh, if you want to do some post-processing of the slide and want to see whether you actually understood uh, all the necessary parts. And in the next lecture, we will talk about compile time variability as kind of the other part of binding time, which is relevant, uh, more relevant uh, to product lines. Uh, and we will look at a particular technique known as clone and on. I hope you enjoyed the lecture and now enjoy the silence. Oh, you're still here, that's actually good because you might be interested to hear what this cute animal uh, was about. Uh, so if you have seen the previous lecture, we were talking about an animal uh, that is uh, probably not very international. Uh, so there's a German term for this and it's Eierlegende Wollmilchsau. So it, it combines the features of several animals uh, like a pig and uh, uh, it will give you some eggs and so on. And the connection of this animal uh, with the lecture is, of course, that we can have all the features in this one product, right? So we have this one, uh, one program, and most of the techniques discussed in this lecture actually uh, are techniques to support this runtime variability in all the possible uh, combinations, and users can configure those parts that they want to have and need. Thanks for watching. See you later.